Perspective, a podcast that dives into the past and present of sci-fi, horror, fantasy, and all things action. Listen to the pack as they discuss cult classics and tell you which mainstream mistakes you can avoid. But the pod isn't just movie and game talk. Get to know some of the wild, real-life guest stars and hear some of their even more wild and scandalous stories. With the intro out of the way, here are your hosts, Hail Caesar and Alex the Wild. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Hill Caesar, along with my co-host, Alex, a.k.a. The White Wolf, a.k.a. OBC. Together, we are the Wolfpack Perspective. Here for a very special episode two, we have Mr. Andy Gunn coming to us all the way from New Zealand. Mr. Gunn is known for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, Mr. Gunn, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Andy Gunn I'm from New Zealand, and I'm really grateful to be on this um, on this cast today, this podcast. So thanks to Alex and Caesar for having me on here. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot. That's pretty yes, much. Sir. So uh, how's the weather where you're at at the moment? Oh man, I'm sitting. I'm actually sitting here in a t-shirt and shorts. You know. Uh, sweating, sweating my butt off right now. It's it's freaking hot. It's they say summer's just started down here, but it feels like we're kind of, you know, a month or two into it. What well, is the oh, damn wow. winter here, my good friends? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So we do not have that luxury. Oh man! I, I, hopefully, I can send some your way. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, Mr. Gunn is very much in the future compared to where we're at right now. Sounds like in a, a pretty good future if it's that warm. It's cold here. Oh, man, how cold you guys got? <laughs> uh, depends on your level of toughness. I think it was the last time I checked around the 30s or something. I thought maybe that was yesterday. I kind of lose train of thought on days and times. So, yeah. See, for us, like 30s is like hot because we use C. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're really living that life. life. So <laughs> I don't know what we are now, but it feels like 25 at least. But it's probably less. But yeah, we're we're in a little island in the South Pacific, so we're kind of you know I'm like 35 k's away from the water, but I feel like I want to jump in the beach right now, just cooking. <laughs> okay, uh, Andy, what kind of uh, just do you live in the city limits? Do you live kind of in the country? Just curious. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm staying currently in my hometown where I was where I was from. There's uh, mm-hmm. Palmerston North, which is a couple of hours, oh, probably only an hour and a half north of, uh, of Wellington, the capital now, in the, in the North Island of New Zealand, or Aotearoa. And, um, you know, they've always been saying we've got about um, 100,000 people in this in the city, but they've been saying that for about 10 years, you know. <laughs> so I'm sure there's like a couple of hundred thousand people around the whole district of, of Manawatu, they call it. Um, but yeah, it's, we're a hop, skip, and a jump to, to Wellington, the capital, where obviously where the, a lot of the Lord of the Rings stuff was filmed. And um, you know, they say we're the gateway. We're, we're uh, not far from um, Lake Topo, uh, which is uh, one of the big um, super volcano explosions. It's a big crater, uh, great for trout fishing and you know boating and all that stuff. And uh, close okay. to the mountains, where you can go skiing and you know just walking around Lake Ruapehu, oh sorry, Lake Tongariro. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're, we're close to the other, uh, the other coast as well, the east coast. So we're sort of in the middle, a couple of hours away. So we're, we're, we're called central, central area. Yeah. Awesome. So you get with us calling you Andy? Of course, yeah. Yeah, Andy. <laughs> so the reason we brought Andy on today is I actually found him on a um, – Lord of the Rings fan page, believe it or not, on Facebook, where you had shared some pictures uh, from your time as an extra on the, were you in the Fellowship and the Two Towers, or all three, or? Yeah, all three, the, the whole trilogy, yeah. Okay, you're on all three. Yeah. So, so tell us, just I guess you could start out at the very beginning, however far back you want to go. Tell us how you got into acting and uh, led into the Lord of the Rings stuff. Yeah, sure. So um, growing up in Palmerston North was, um, I went to a Catholic school and it was pretty, you know, a couple of hundred kids. 
and we had the church on the, on the on premise. Uh, um, I went to a church school called Our Lady of Lourdes, and we, we were always, you know, going along to watch, you know, the you know, the nativity thing on Christmas, and there was, you know, church twice a week, once with school, once with, you know, the family. And so we, I don't know, I just got attracted to kind of like that stuff. I was like, man, how can I get up there and, you know, be part of this ritual? How can I, you know, be part of the magic? And um, so I went along to like a drama club when I was like 10 years old at the local Regent Theatre and we'd just play all these crazy games. And, you know, I didn't really want to tell the, the kids at my school that I was going to this drama club after school because I didn't want them to think I was like a, a wimp or a weakling or a sissy or gay or something, you know? Sure. <laughs> So I, I just, it was a fantasy land, eh? it was so much fun, it was cool, you know, people from all over the region, so did that for like a year, and then I think I got like a job working the lights for Joseph in the Technicolor Dream Coat in, in my primary school, which, you know, it was a lot of fun, but I really wanted to be on stage, but I was, I was too shy, you know, um, so that was a bit of a, bit of a strange one, um, but then after that, I tried out for my high school um, uh, production. I think it was called Pompeii when I was about 14 or 15. And uh, ultimately I was, I, was kind of, I was kind of dark on all the, I used to call them the Christians because most of the kids that did that stuff were like, you know, drama or into, you know, Christianity as well as that stuff. But I just kind of wanted what they had, you know, they were like ripping off lines of Shakespeare and, you know, being the leads in these shows. And I was like, you know, I was really shy and it was, <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing. So I got myself a job as an extra on Pompeii when I was 16 and, um, you know, Caesar cut, toga, you know, sandals, the whole, the whole thing. And I got myself one oh. line. And the line was something crazy, like just like a heckling street scene or a market scene, like, you know, Eunice, Eunice, the eunuch, you know, like kind of a dissing, <laughs> a dissing call. And um, problem was I'd, I'd gone out and had a big blaze on a joint um, before the show. And um, I was, I, was, I don't even know what time it was. Eh? <laughs> so I, um, I miscued and I think I cut in a couple of, like quite a few lines before it was necessary to say that line. And bro, like people were just like, <laughs> but you couldn't believe people were just laughing their heads off. You know, all the people were just coming out of character. The, you know, the audience was like, who's this guy, you know? Where's that shepherd's crook? Um, and yeah, pretty much I, I just died. Eh? I was like, man, I felt so stink paranoid as and um yeah i don't know how i survived the season but that, that was my first that was my first foray into into the whole acting game yeah um <laughs> oh, was that a play i'm guessing yeah yeah it was called pompeii it was about like um the city pompeii that like you know supposedly yeah. you know blew up with the you know i don't know what mountain it was was it vesuvius and in, in, in italy um, yeah a couple couple thousand years ago but yeah that was our like our type of colleges high school version of, of Pompeii, you know, um, but that, that was, that was huge. That was big. Yeah. I was glad I was, I think it was like, now carry on. So I think it weed was frowned upon, I'm guessing over there at that time, <laughs> maybe it gave you some courage, you know, you never know. Yeah. Uh, pretty much. I mean, the nineties, I think it was like 1990 or 91 in New Zealand. It was, yeah, I was still there. I was still around, but it was wasn't really socially acceptable. I was sort of sneaking around the, you know, the, the hockey fields or down the river with your friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was definitely present. Yeah. Yeah. Now it, in the states, it's pretty much overlooked almost at this point. It ain't even a thing now. It ain't even taboo anymore here. Oh wow. It's yeah. yeah I mean, it, that's so cool. I mean, I've. I've been hearing some great stuff about weed in, in the States and how, you know, even places like California where you can go in into a dispensary and buy any kind of wand and things. But in New Zealand, it's still, it's still illegal, uh, which is incre it's crazy. You know, we're still buying $20 worth of, of marijuana in, a, in, a, in like a little foil tin, you know, from that thing called a tinny house down the road. And it's, it's still a bit sneaky, but it's slowly changing. I think that's some of the attitudes... Uh, you know, slowly changing, but the law so, has. Uh, do you think Pompeii was that kind of the catalyst for you at that point in time, saying I want to try to do this acting thing, or was it something that happened <laughs> later on? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I don't know if Pompeii. I mean, Pompeii put me off. I was like, <laughs> I 
I was pretty ashamed about my uh, <laughs> my role, also my my performance, obviously. But um, you know, we used to kick back and and watch a lot of TV because you know we just thought we wanted American culture. We loved it. You know, it was huge in the '90s. You know, it was it was, it was massive. Mm-hmm. So I used to watch, you know, Falcon Crest, Dynasty, you know, Knight Rider, the A Team, anything and everything I could. And um, 90210, and I remember watching. Um, I think it was Brian Austin Green. He did like a, a cover of of Dars FX. Um, and I, I was just sold because I was listening to Dars FX, you know, and they were touring around America and I think around the sort of oh. university scene back in the day, sort of boom, stiggity, you know, this crazy, they had that crazy Dars FX style. And I was like, man, that's it. That's that's for me. I want to be, I want to be an actor and I want to be a rapper done, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll be like this guy, uh, this guy, um, David Silver off, off, off TV. And um, yeah, so that that was me. I was I was collecting, you know, records. Moved down to Wellington from Palmy, Palmston North, my hometown. I was um going along to you know rap shows, and um I thought this is it. I remember seeing Ice T at the university with his band wow. Body Count, straight at, straight out of America. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is it. This is this is entertainment. You know, <laughs> this is this is the industry I want to be. In. Yeah. Started DJing, bought some turntables, um, you know, got into a couple of rap battles and stuff, got fourth in a rap battle at a local pub, got flown to Auckland to, to battle a whole lot of, you know, guys that are a bit more professional in the big smoke in Auckland. And, you know, just had a lot of fun. You know, we put on little shows and promote, um, promote our DJs and our MCs and our rappers and make flyers and hand them out all over town, make ads on the radio. And... Um, yeah, that's what that's what we were doing. Um, battling. Well, I'll give, yeah, I'll give you credit for that one, Andy. I don't know. I don't think I have the wit and the comeback to the rap battle and stuff. It's <laughs> way too slow. Could not get up on stage and do that. You must have seen like Eight Mile or something over with Eminem back in the day. Or oh yeah, I loved know. it. I snuck into theaters and watched it a few times. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you you know you know what we're talking about, yeah. Oh heck yeah. Yep. And, um, and that was, that was around the time when I was, you know, like I, I done, I think I did like an acting course and, um, cause I was like, how can I get into this acting thing? You know, this, you know, rap steps, rap's hard. It's, it's an art, it's a craft, it's a culture, you know, mm-hmm. but the, um, the acting thing, I remember doing like a week course, um, it's called young and hungry, um, drama, um, courses. And they did it at the local drama school. And we spent a week with um, some Kiwi actors and directors. I think it was Gaylene Preston, Miranda Harcourt, um, and, a, and a couple of others. And um, I just thought this was really cool. I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily very good. Um, I didn't feel very confident, but I just had that kind of like, I want to do this. I want to try this. And I remember at the, at the end of the week, I was like, oh, so into it. You know, I was like, man, you know, I'm, I'm halfway an actor, you know? <laughs> Sure. And and the director comes up and goes, um, oh, um, Andy, um, yeah, hey, thanks for the week, bro. Um, you know, um, yeah, if you do decide to carry on with that thing, you know, good on you. <laughs> it sort of just broke my heart, and I was like, oh, because I just got the, you know, the vibe that I that I wasn't good enough, and you know, I needed to try a whole lot better and and things. And it was other actors had done like sort of 75 plays by the time they were 21 or 23. And, you know, sort of, hi, I've been in the theater since I was two. I was on an ice cream ad. And then it just, it just went like wildfire from there. Sort of, sort of people. And I was, I was quite intimidated by those people. Where I was like, man, how do, how do I do that? How do I get it like on a Levi's ad when I'm seven, you know? Um, yeah. But that just I was wasn't curious there. about that, about how old were you at that time where you were in that acting class? Cause I, I kind of understand where you're coming from with, these other people that have been in it since they were in grade school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, like I, I did that little drama th- club thing, which was great fun. Just, I think it should have been, you know, compulsory stuff, but it was, you know, extracurricular when I was 10 and that was only for like a year or so. And then I was in Pompeii when I was a teenager. And then I think I was 23 or 24 when I did this week acting course, just like a summer course. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of like, because I really wanted to get into the season of the Young and Hungry plays. And so I read, 
um, I wasn't really sure and I was, I was fully intimidated. So I re remember reading a book by John Kehoe. I don't know if you've read it called Mind Power. I think that was just like his first one. Uh -huh. And he was just talking about how you can trick yourself. You can convince yourself of anything. And so um, like a couple of times a week before I went to sleep, I was like doing this exercise called seeding where you just imagine the feeling kind of like law of attraction before the secret came out. And I was just imagining, you know, that I was getting the play and I was acting in the play and that it was awesome. And yeah, I nailed it. Even though I'd wake up in the morning, go, I didn't <laughs> obviously had it. I just, you know, I'm just imagining. And then I remember going along to like a bunch of auditions and then, you know, six months later for like four or five plays and um, doing some more mind power and cold reading, practicing on scripts and practicing on everyone. And then when I got there, I was so high. They were telling me to chill out. I was like, hey, man, I look forward to catching up with you and smashing the cold reading of the scripts and sitting around and like all these other guys that had done like 50 plays, you know, or whatever. They were looking at me like, what a dick. <laughs> look at that guy. <laughs> But I made an impact on the directors, I'm sure, um, because I was like, yeah, awesome. And did like, you know, all these auditions and, and then walked away and got nothing. You know, I didn't, didn't get a role. I think it was like a week later or so. I was pretty, pretty gutted. Um, went out and got drunk. Um, not a good thing. <laughs> and then they sort of, they gave me the consolation prize. They sort of said, oh, hey, bro, um, do you want to come down and be a tech? Um, with, you know, there's, there's a show that needs like a guy to just, you know, run the lights and the sound all good. So I turned up and, um, and it was like a director's name was Jason, Jason White. And, um, and Brett McKenzie was a musical director. And they were like, oh, hey man, can you, um, can you sing a song on the guitar and read some script? We've had an actor pull out from one of our plays. And I was like, yeah, man. And, uh, and they were like, oh, what, what song are you gonna sing? And I was like, oh, the only song I know. And they were like, what's that? It's like Metallica, nothing else matters. And they were like, okay, sing that. <laughs> so I sang that and it was pretty wibbly, pretty, a little bit horrible. And um, just cold read some script, three pages of script. And they said, cool, you're the lead man, you got it. Boom, you're the actor, you're the man. Damn, and I was like, damn. what? <laughs> what you talking about, you know? Um, hey, and so, so that was- like, Karen, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, so, I went from like drunken loser being a tech guy. I didn't want to be a tech guy. I wanted to be the, you know, the lead actor to, to lead actor. And I was like, yeah, you know it. <laughs> so I was pretty blown away. Pretty had never so, acted. It sounds like changing your mindset definitely helped you out though. I mean, they always say fake it till you make it. I mean, it sounded like that was actually working for you. Exactly. Like my, my I mean, my thinking kind of, you know, defaulting to negativity and, 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 and sort of thinking, oh, I suck, you know, and, and, and that stuff. I mean, but you're right. It was that, it was those mindsets that, that seeding that kind of got me, got me over the line. Um, okay. So, so that was the idea. You're now, you you're now a lead actor in this. Uh, was that, play, uh, was that your first go as lead actor? And how long after that, before you heard the news of the Lord of the Rings coming to New Zealand? Yeah, good call. So I was first time acting and first time lead acting and I had to, sing and play guitar and act in the in the show so we did a couple of months of rehearsals and then we performed it for like a month like i don't know three or four nights a week and then after that i got an agent and just walked into the great the best agent in wellington said i need an agent and i <laughs> done one thing and he goes oh why do you want to be an agent why do you want to be an actor and, he, and i said oh because the girls are a lot better looking in the theater than they are in the bank and just said it cold. <laughs> and he laughed. He goes, hey, man, that was pretty, sh that was pretty shit, but you got me. I'm finding it funny. And then that's when the offer came in. He said, do you want to, would you like to be a fighting elf for two weeks? Um, there's this thing, it's, there's this movie. No one really knew much about it. And, and, and there's those times, um, you know, fighting. Oh, no, no, no. I'm jumping ahead. I did six auditions for this movie that no one knew much about in that year in 1999. And I got nothing. It was just cattle calls, you know, turn up, Hobbit. And I didn't really know much about Tolkien. I was like, you know, I stole a copy of The Hobbit from my school library when I was 11 just because it had a cool cover. I was like, yeah, man, that's cool, you know, and didn't read it. <laughs> just kept it with my collection, hoarded it, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I did a bunch of auditions, just went along, you know, cattle call, not really doing much, move around, here's a stick, here's a sword, you know. Um, 
one of the auditions was uh, they were like, oh, do you want to play for the, um, the role of Haldir? And I was like, yeah, cool, man. I'm, I'm in, you know. So me and a bunch of guys all went along and uh, they gave us like an, it was craziest audition. They gave us like an orc sword and they said, move like an elf, go. And I was like, okay, how does an elf move? And they're like, balletic, come on, like, like a balletic elf. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so, that, so that was it. And then, um, you know, spit out the lines that you're supposed to have remembered. You know, and I kind of roughly remembered them, you know, not that good. So I had to read them cold uh, from, the, from the paper. And they were like, cool, man. Thank you, Mr. Gunn. Goodbye. <laughs> and I was like, what's this? And then I found out months later that, because um, I was running around town saying, hey, I just auditioned for hell there, you know, walk away, stop it. And then they said, no, no, they, they'd already cast um, Craig Parker, but they just needed to find some body doubles, bro. And I was like, oh, so I was, <laughs> so I was let down I again. Craig but, um, Parker is a pretty big actor, at least here. I know he played in Spartacus, a few other things. Yeah, yeah, he's huge. I mean, he was he was big in, in New Zealand back in the day before that because he was on the um, on the Shortland Street, you know, for years, and everyone he was a household name. Um, but I mean, obviously, you know, rings pushed him into into the you know into that international market. So not to backtrack, but to just step back for a minute. When Lord of the Rings was announced that they were going to start filming uh, in New Zealand and started looking for people. Was that, mm. was that a big deal over there? Was was Lord of the Rings something pretty well known or were most people kind of? Yeah, I mean, it, it was, but I mean, obviously people in the, in the film industry and people in the entertainment industry knew, you know, they knew that it was big, but it, it was as well. It was becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, but it was kind of, in, I figure it was kind of in stages, you know, they had the, obviously they had the go ahead and the, the local papers and the national media got involved in it and stuff like that. So then it just started to sort of slowly, you know, get bigger and bigger and bigger o- over the year, but there was still a little bit of a mystery about it, unless you were directly working for Jackson or, you know, Weta or the, the likes, but it was, yeah, so it was kind of mixed, I guess. Um, but yeah, it was for me. It was a bit of a tough year because I was, you know, I was trying to be a, a, an actor, but you know, I was trying to find employment and I was working in construction, laboring, and you know, doing bits and pieces here and there. And then I found myself back in Palmerston North, you know, out of Wellington, doing more construction, laboring, you know, just trying to pay the rent. And um, you know, was working um, with quite a grumpy guy, and you know, you get stuck working with one of those guys, and it's like, you know, there's not much to talk about. So I was, I, was, I, was, I think I was depressed at the time and I went and hung out with one of my mates who's a Christian and he's like, what are you up to? And I'm like, I'm looking for God. And he's like, oh, okay. And I goes, I'll pray for you tonight. Just, just call out to God before you go to sleep, man. It'll be sweet. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, for sure. Didn't really know what was up. And um, so before I went to sleep that night, I was like, I'll just give it a crack. You know? So I said, oh, God, um, I just want to know if you're real, as in a real deal. And can I have a job on Lord of the Rings, please? Like, no shit. Like, that was, that was my selfish prayer, you know? <laughs> selfish actor. <Horrible. laughs> but honest. And, um, and just at that moment, I kid you not, you know, I was soberer than a judge. You know, a beam of white light came into my room and went through the top of my head and down through my spine. And it seemed to emanate from out of my chest. I kid you not. And filled up my entire room with this, like, white mist like this magical mist. And then I started crying and I felt no fear. And the only thing I felt was love. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. This ain't some acid trip. This ain't some Mary Jane. You know, this is real deal. The Holy Spirit, someone told me years later. And um, I was kind of like, whatever, you know, shrugged it off, went to work in the morning. And um, I didn't even have a cell phone back in the day. And this, this guy, he goes, oh, hey, hey, um, the phone, my phone's for you. It's your, it's your mum. And I was like, what? <laughs> And it was mum on the phone. She goes, oh, hey, your agent called for Wellington and you've, you've got this, um, you've got the seventh audition on this Lord of the Rings movie. You better go to Wellington ASAP. And I was like, hey, <laughs> thanks, God. <laughs> so I, I kind of like, you know, <laughs> I was like, God's real. That's awesome. And um, he answered my wish within 24 hours. What a legend. You know? <laughs> it's good to have confirmation sometimes. And man, you yeah. had to feel like a million bucks when that happened, though. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that was I was like, hey man, you know that cash you owe me, you know, bro. And he's like, what? I was like, I was like, just keep it, man. That's my that's my koha, my gift to you. And he goes, no, you can't leave. I need you for the next week. And I was like, no, man, I'm going to Wellington, brother. <laughs> so uh, yeah, on, on a train down to Wellington, and 
straight into the audition and it was me and this kind of goth gothy kind of kid this uh he was a bit skinnier than me like i'm not that obviously not that fat i was pretty slim at the time but um this guy is pretty skinny and a bit it's kind of like me that was like my shadow self you know and they gave us they said strip into your undies and we're like oh come on then there's like all the casting agents that are, you know 90 percent women sitting at a desk kind of laughing and there's me and a bunch of us and we're just running around in our boxer shorts with these i think we had elf swords that time and they're like all right the stunt guy showed us like a couple of a couple of basic moves, you know, just some basic elf sword form stuff. And they're like, right, you're going to perform this to the casting agents in a minute. And this will be your decider whether they take you into the movie or not. And I was like, oh, man. And I, <laughs> this kid I was working with, like he was my, my sword partner. I was like, right, just just breathe, bro. Like, we're going to do this. We're both going to get in, man. And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And I was just, just fake it till you make it, bro. Like, <laughs> I was like, I've come this far. I'm not going to let you ruin it for me, man. And we did our form and it was like real tense. And, you know, we, we tried our, our best to, to sell the moves. And they're like, cool, thank you. Just, and I think we, they, we did the balletic running across the room with the sword. And, and that was it. We were, we were out of there. And then they gave us, a, that was when my agent called me, like, I don't know, probably a couple of weeks later or even later and said, oh, hey, man, you've been offered two weeks as a fighting elf. I'll never forget that. Do you want to do it? And I was like, oh, yeah, of course, of course. Of <laughs> course. But the, um, the the agent Steve Steve the hoodie said you, he just said, pulled me aside and said you don't want to be an extra, and I was like why? <laughs> he goes because if you're an actor you want to be an actor you don't want to be an extra ever and I was like oh oh man I'm I'm the man of one play <laughs> I I want to do this I, I totally want to do this so he's like okay he goes you'll just get lost on a hill man you'll just be one of a, a million one of a thousand you know. What is it? What is? Um, what do they say? Third from third spear carrier from the left. But I didn't care. I was like, I'm, I'm going for it. And um, so we, um, we got the call. I went and bought a cell phone, um, and it buzzed my ear for half, you know, half an hour conversation. <laughs> first cell phone. Did you, do you ever remember buzzing your ear when you had it, when you had your first cell phone, or was that to me, some crappy little Alcatel? But um, that was that was my link to casting, and. Um, you know, I still remember the first going out to the first night on set and getting into the uncomfortable Elven armor and getting, you know, getting the sort of plasticky um, synthetic wig and that sort of fiberglassy helmet. And then it was like six o'clock and then we were going to breakfast because we were doing night shoots. And I remember walking out onto set. Uh, I know I was down at the, the mess hall the, where we get um, had lunch and, you know, got, got changed into the costumes, wetter, the wetter department. And there was like, probably about 300 yurikai with their helmets off all sitting around singing sweet, you know, Maori music, like songs. And there was a guy with a guitar. And I was like, man, what is this? <laughs> this is insane. This is it. And it was kind of scary, yeah, because we hadn't seen costumes before, all these yurikai. And then there was a whole lot of elves still getting ready. And I was like, man, this, this is just nuts. This is like an acid trip, you know? So was the, the Helm's Deep scene, is that what you're talking about there? Yeah. Yeah, so that was how the first, that, was, that was your first experience with the Lord of the Rings. Yes, yes, that was the Helm's Deep. We were straight into Helm's Deep, and um, you know, stunts, background extras. <clears throat> um, I think I jumped ahead a little bit. I did a three-day stunt workshop right at the start of the year, the start of two thousand. It was like sort of just right at the end of January, three days, and um, that's when we learned. I didn't realize, but it was an unofficial audition for the like the 18th stunt Lord of the Rings stunt team as well. And um, so we in that workshop, we before we got onto set, we did um, you know sword fighting, we did Urukai, we did orc, we did elven blade work, we did dive rolling, how to fall from heights um, onto those big fat mats like the, the pro stunt guys. And, and we didn't realize, but all all the while the, the stunt coordinators were were sort of because they had a good stunt team already, but they were searching for another couple of um, people to to come on board. And then once I kind of got the grip of that and the, and, the, and the days I remember fighting, you know, doing some sword form, some Elven Blade stuff with a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, um, people used to always confuse us, this guy Kester. And he, we were like in like almost every scene together. He was in Fighting Elf, I was in Fighting Elf. He was a Yurik, I was a Yurik. And people were like, oh, hey, Kester. And I'm like, no, nah, it's Andy <laughs> and vice versa. But I remember freaking out kind of like the, the other kid in the audition. And then this guy, I think it was, his name was Petey or Petey. He kind of, he was, he was looking and then he just walked in and goes, thanks guys. And I just, I knew I'd blown it. I was like, ah, oh, I could have been in the A-team and the stunt and the, you know, in the A-team for the stunt 
Mm. But um, okay, it wasn't bad. A couple of guys got in and they went on to, um, um, you probably know one of them, Alan Smith. He, he started at that stunt workshop and he went on to um, double for Legolas. And then he okay. went on to just have a pretty much A grade stuntman career. Um, even now, I think even now he's, he's doing it, but he's probably doing a lot more coordinating these days. Um, but that was okay. So we became like a kind of a B team or even um, sort of a reserve stunt team where we weren't doing all the serious stuff. We were doing the background fighting. And so we had a crew of about, I'd say probably about 20 of us, maybe a dozen or 15 of us. And so, yeah, we were doing the three to four second um, fights right behind the principal actor. You know, there was an Aragon or Legolas or um, Arwen or who, whoever it was, we, they'd throw in a, a through P, some PNS, they called us pack and save, kind of kind of like budget stuntmen. And we had one woman uh, at, right in there in the action if, if they needed us. Um, and I remember being a Uruk and, you know, going through the, the, the breach wall. And one of, my, one of my fight scenes was to go up and take a couple of swings at Legolas early on and um and i remember just wilding out about being a bit starstruck and going oh shit you know and then because i'd never seen Lee glass before orlando bloom and 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 it was actually his stunt double doing all the because this guy was like a master a maestro his name was morgan um, um rest in peace rest in power but he goes i'm not legalist i'm a stunt man and he looked you know i actually think he looked like a better legalist than than Legolas, than, than, than Orlando did, don't tell anyone, but <laughs> but, he, but I was like, oh, and I so relaxed, he goes, no, 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 let's do this, and so, you know, I took a couple of swings, he stabs me, you know, I fall down, and and we do a rehearsal, and it's all good, and then we did the actual take, and then I fall down, dead, dead Uruk, and my um, my dreadlocks, my, my Uruk eye hair starts burning, and they're still shooting, and I'm like, ah, <laughs> so it's, um, you know, just lay there and, you know, it's kind of like you can't see much in that Uruk helmet. You can only see like a, it's like, they call it like a letterbox. You just see like two little slits and it, it's quite crazy. Um, you know, so you just, that's all you see. And so you don't have as much awareness, but it's like a, it's like a sumo suit with all the muscles, the prosthetics, and then all the chain mail and then all the armor on top of that. It's quite a crazy um thing to be in and the sandals were you know were good but they looked amazing but they weren't so hot for running and so i you know i found that out on day one but that was cool and then one of the big highlights was was i think it might have been Liv tyler's first night on set was was pretty eye-opening and um we waited for hours we, i mean i think we waited till about three or four in the morning um and we were wrapping it about i don't know what time we were wrapping as soon as the sun came up so five or six and it was like Bob Anderson came out and it was like, oh, she, she walked through her, her sequence and she had to kill a couple of people, step over me. I was a dead, um, I think I was a dead elf that day. And um, and she sort of looked me in the eye and goes, do you want to trade places? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget that. Eh? Like I had a, I had a, a, a sword, probably a, a Urukai sword wound in the neck and I was, I was a dead elf and I'd been waiting for her for hours and she finally got there but I was really grateful that she actually acknowledged me and said something uh, I'll melt today I mean a lot of men would I mean so she you just looked phenomenal you know you knew her the second you saw her you're like yeah there's Liv Tyler there's one of the stars of the movie absolutely yeah it was it was highly anticipated it was like oh it's Liv Tyler's first night on set you know tonight and um she wasn't, I mean, she'd, she'd been rehearsing with a lot of the, you know, a lot of the other leads um, with the sword play, but she had um, Bob Anderson, the, the famous swordsmith or swordsman. I think he played, someone said he played like, uh, not so hot, but I think he played like Darth Vader or someone. He was this huge guy, this older guy, and he was the, the king of the swords. And he was telling her, he was like, we, we were sort of like loitering, you know, on set. And he was like, girly, you just got to get in there and just do it. Just, just, <laughs> just own it and just be the character <laughs> we were just like wow like that's i mean you couldn't get much better advice than that you know um that, that was that was pretty amazing but yeah she she definitely had an, an energy about her where you know she walked into the lunch tent you know 200 people would just stop what they're doing and just look and go well hey there's the tyler there's that you know, there she is so that, she did have a, ma a magical energy um you know even just in, in the downtime which was pretty cool to see. So was that a scene that got deleted later on? I'm not sure, right? Eh? I mean, that was Helm's Deep. I mean, obviously they had 
ridiculous amounts of budget. So Peter Jackson would often, his catch cry was like, um, all right, we've just done like four or five takes. And you go, okay, well, let's just do one more for luck, shall we? And we're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, and then it, and then it, it, there might often be a couple more for luck. He'd say, "Oh, we'll just do, we'll just do one more for luck," and then he'd say, "We'll do one more for luck because we can." And this this hilarious stuff, but you know, God knows where that footage, you know, whatever that footage was. But um, yeah, that was. And then Legolas is first night on set. It was like outdoor theatre. Like they had him, you know, racing around full of beams. I think it was the scene where he was racing down the stairs on on, on the shield. In the, in the Helm's Deep, and um, they, you know, they had stunt people doing it, but then they had he did some stuff, and then I never forget he was talking to Peter Jackson, and he said something like he was so enthusiastic, you know, <laughs> he was basically like an energizer bunny, and I remember him saying in front of I don't know three or four hundred people, he was like, Peter, do you mind if I have a look at the monitor of what I've just done? And, and Peter's like, No, no, sir, and people laughed. They were like. <laughs> Look at this guy. <laughs> he wants to he wants to do the action and then go down and watch the monitor and then he hasn't been invited to just this yet. And and, and people were just cracking up, kind of like, oh come on, look at this, look at this, bro, you know, look at this tall poppy. But it's Peter Jackson's like, no, 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 you know, like we'll just carry on, we'll just keep you keep getting you to do your your action there, sir, and 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 things. And I think that was a night that there was a pike scene where um all the Urukai are holding out pikes sort of down at kind of waist height and we, we charge them and Aragon's leading it. And I was, I was luckily enough to be, to be one of those owls where we raced down this sort of crumbly rocky quarry and we had to do a sort of a little slick move where we push the pikes out of the way and just sort of slide in um, with Aragon, Aragon leading us. I remember that I was pretty impressed with that, but those, those elf, um, suede boots are not so good for running on rocky <laughs> rocky quarry um sets um but it was just like man like this this is cool this is cool fun this this there, felt like the real deal so during your time you played an elf an uruka what a, and that's just in the helm steep battle right yeah that's right that's right so i mean we we got hired as i mean they said do you want to be a fighting elf for a couple of weeks and then as soon as we got there it just got mixed up they're like oh tonight you're being a uruk a urukai um, I think one day I played an elf for half the day and then I was a Yurikai in the evening or in the second part of the, um, the, the shooting. Um, yeah, so we were just constantly changing, 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 changing. What other roles did you what play was the, uh, in the other movies or in that movie? Um, played, I mean, it was cool fun playing a Rivendell elf. So, you know, not having to wear the armor and, and things. And, you know, they'd spend a bit more time on the, on the makeup so, you know, put the ears on you, um, put a real hair wig and be out to Rivendell, which is a completely different set. It was about an hour out of Wellington, um, out of the Rivendell set. And just, you're just essentially just standing around. <laughs> you know, um, some, some action would happen, you know, like some of the, the principal, the fellowship, some of the hobbits would walk in, you know, and, and you'd just be like, cool, because your background, you know, and then you can just sift off, you know, and go to the lunch tent or hang out with some other other um, Elven extras. Um, played a ring wraith. Did there's, I think there's an aerial scene um, where they chase the ring wraiths are chasing hobbits. And so they said, do, do you want to play ring wraith? I was like, hell yeah. So, you know, five in the morning, we, we went up to a, it was another old quarry site, but they had a pretty amazing um, camera angle where they made this like crazy dead land where there's like, I think it was about a half a dozen ring wraiths sort of running in on this, on this single hobbit. And that was, that was our scene. So they filled it up with like sort of dead trees up to sort of like your knees. And then they, they filled it up with this crazy kind of special effects smoke that just stayed there. I don't know how they did it. It just, the smoke just stayed at like your knee, your knee height. It was amazing. And then we, you know, had to wear the, um, the ring wraith costume. And then we had to run sort of, they told us to glide. They said, you guys have got to kind of like just glide along. Like you don't have, you know, um, like any feet almost like you're sort of just like flying along, you know, and that was difficult because the shoes had big silver spurs out front. And yeah, it was quite, quite crazy. Um, I remember, um, you know, stumbling and falling over the brambury bushes a few times and, and they're like, nah, man, glide, like <laughs> make, make it look like you're like, you know, almost like flying. And I was like, Oh, come on, man. Like, 
So I said a little prayer at the back. I, I felt like a bit of a badass in the costume. And I was like, there must be some evil spirits, you know, floating around. So I remember saying, I was, I was a bit scared as well, but I said, oh, if there's any evil spirits that can kind of like make me glide rather than, you know, jog along like some sort of, you know, crazy jogger, runner, um, I'd be helpful. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be grateful. And, um, and then I kind of laughed it off. Well, what am I doing? This is stupid. What do I know about magic or, you know, or spirituality? And then they said, they said action. And then it felt like there was this hand seriously came out of the nowhere. It's like five in the morning. It was misty. It was dark. It was evil pushing me along really fast. And then I just couldn't stop at the end. And I actually went over all these like raspberry bushes and got all these like um, little, what do they call them? Those little pricks from the bushes all over me. And people are like, well, you were quick out the gate. Why were you running so fast? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I was like really freaked out after that. I was like, um, I think my, I think doing magic in this costume and asking for evil help is, is not a good idea. Um, but yeah, it was pretty freaky. Um, so that, that, was, that was probably one of the baddest, meanest um, characters to play. Um, yeah, I played a bunch. I, I think I got, I had to go almost, almost everything that I could um, that they'd throw at me. That I'd be like, yep, yeah. you know, some of them I kind of remember. Um, uh, Citadel Guard. Uh, Rohan, soldier, um, 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 Gondorian ranger, Gondorian soldier. The Gondorian soldier was like they used to call it. We used to call the costume that it was like being a Tin Man. It's like, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm a Tin Man because the costume was like you felt like the Tin Man from the Wizard of Oz. But obviously, it wasn't as heavy. What uh, and all those roles? Which one was your favorite? Hmm. Favorite, favorite, favorite. Yeah, good question. I'd probably say the, I mean, the, the fighting elf was, that was, the, that was probably my favorite character because it was just so cool, you know, like got a bow and arrow, mm -hmm. you've got an electroplated fiberglass chest plate that looks like, you know, gold leaf on your chest. You've got a real heel wig, you've got ears and you've got a sword. So you're kind of, you're, you're, you're a bit of a badass as a character, but the most comfortable costume for me was the, um, I think it was the Gondorian Ranger costume. It was like the, the woolen and the leather and the van braces and the, the big solid kind of sturdy leather boots and, and the, the kind of mullety um, uh, wig, whether it was synthetic or real, wasn't, wasn't such a biggie. And the most annoying one was the um, Rohan because they always used to put the beard on you, <laughs> put the sticky on little moustache that would come off while you're eating and then they'd come in and glue it back on again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, probably, yeah, the elf was the coolest, my favorite, and Gondorian Ranger was the most comfortable. Um, okay. Yeah. So Alex is probably a bigger fan of Lord of the Rings than I am, but I will say that I saw the two towers in theater. It's the only one I saw on the big screen. And mostly it was the Battle of Helm's Deep. That was the coolest, most lasting memory I've got from the movies, period. Sure. And I'm curious how, how accurate what we saw on the big screen was the set you were working on, like the fortress. Was it spot on accurate? Yes, yes, pretty much. I mean, they had the scale. There's a photo that I posted up on the, the Lord of the Rings fan page, you know, on the, on the Facebook. There was a scale model of, of Helmsleep. I don't know if you probably saw that, and we're all standing in front of it, that they used. And then there was like a... I don't know how high it was, the 20-foot wall or the 30-foot wall, um, like real scale with the breach. Um, and then yeah, later on when I think it was even, we did a lot of pickup shots in um, a studio in Rongatai where they had uh, a wall set up as well, like a, a, a to scale, like a proper high wall set up as well. So, I mean, that, it was, it was pretty much it. I mean, getting on the set at Helm's Deep at um, the quarry in Lower Hutt, it was just like, um, where are you going? I'm going to Helm's Deep. Everyone knew. Because the quarry, you know, was a whole lot of stones everywhere, trucks everywhere. There was all these different levels. There was like a top level, a middle level, and sort of like a lower level where there was all this different stuff happening. And the top level one was where they did the um, breach in the wall. And, you know, hundreds of us stood out there in the infamous rain tower incident where they were sort of essentially testing the, the this this rain tower we, you know it was just just 
basically because we found out that you know rain doesn't show up on on film so they need to bring in synthetic rain and there was hundreds of us ready to you know attack you know as, as urukai and and what had happened was they they just cranked up for a test this rain tower and um just saturated us on, a, on quite a cold night in the middle of the middle of the night there and um I don't even think anyone had drawn a sword or even charged on the, on the breach. Um, and people were getting hypothermia, hypothermia, and some people were turning blue. Some people got sent home. <laughs> it was a bit of a bit of an embarrassment and a bit of a hiccup. But you know, we got through it. Had a hot chocolate and put a blanket on, kind of thing. Most of us survived. Um, but the the classic one where they said, "Look, you know, there might be a bit of water or there might not. Um, but you know, just run through the breach and you know you're all good." So they said to action and then they let down, that was the, one of the nights they let down like the tsunami of water. And it just took out like the first couple of rows of, you know, these guys in Urukai sort of, you know, full, full battle mode going head first, just knocked them over. And I was like, I was somewhere up the back and I was like, holy hell, you know. And essentially these guys were falling down in this big kind of pond of, of water. And we, we were just running over the top of them, like literally running over the top of these guys that were alive in these suits. You know, just just getting through because because this was this was the the battle for Helm's Deep, and then you know carried on. You know, I don't know how long that 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 action um, sequence was, and then it was like, oh, cut, 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 <laughs> get some get some people in there to pull those people out of the water and get their helmets off and their masks off, and we were like, oh man, like, <laughs> and then there was stuff like there was like floating rocks in there as well, so they you know obviously they couldn't use those takes, um, but yeah, it's just madness and mayhem, eh? You know. And, and all that stuff was uh, was obviously they needed that that element of surprise. That's why they didn't they didn't let us know because they didn't want us kind of a- anticipating the tsunami of water um, and things. But yeah, lo- lots and lots of fun, quite crazy, and yeah, and it just carried on night after night. So, so mm-hmm. during your time on the set, I'm sure you met a lot of the main cast. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, everyone wanted to meet everyone. And, you know, it was kind of like the casting agents were running around saying, don't look them in the eye, don't talk to the principal actors, you know, the leads, you know, just all this, all this sort of kind of movie culture nonsense. Um, But it was all there. And then people were telling stories about Val Kilmer. They're like, did you hear about Val Kilmer? We're like, what? They're like, oh, Val Kilmer's got a contract where he, you know, if you look him in the eye, (laughs) it was all this stuff. But I remember, um, I remember dancing like five in the morning after I'd made a coffee to some crazy music at the unit thing and, um, and dancing. And I think I was in like a Rohan costume with a hat on and, and like just getting crazy. Cause I thought I was a bit of an awesome dancer and there was a bunch of extras in front of me just laughing, but they were looking behind me and they were like, yeah. And then I turn around and, and who was there, but it was like Viggo Mortensen and, and he clapped and gave me a smile. He goes, man, that was, that was cool. That was, that was, that was good. Dancing. And I was like, Oh, cheers, man. And I was really, I don't know why, but I was just really embarrassed. I was like, I was kind of embarrassed because I was like, oh, you know, you're, you're King Aragorn, you know, and, you know, I had a bit, had a bit of a, a quick chat, but not really much, eh? you know, like, um, I, was, I was just, I was still a little bit shy with him for some reason, but he was, he was really down to earth. He was really centered. He, he, he did all his own stunts, you know, one of his, one of his, um, there was a stunt man dressed up in, in King Aragorn, you know, Aragorn's clothing. And I think it was day one. He said, put that guy in his tracksuit. I I'd, I'd do all my own stunts, you know, come on, which is pretty cool. But, yeah. I remember um, I wanted to talk to Liv Tyler because, you know, it was, you know, Liv Tyler. And I remember we were doing, I think they were doing pickup, we were doing pickup shoots. And I think I was like a Gondorian soldier. Must have been for like Return of the King, if I remember. And there was about, I don't know, it must have been like a half a dozen people walking or off to the bathroom. But it was really hot in, this, in the sound stages in Stone Street Studios. And we'd been in there for a few hours doing the kind of, I don't know what it was, like the, the wedding scene or the throwing the flowers or what have you. And I remember there was a guy I know who's assistant director. And I was like, oh, hey, how's it going? And I started a conversation with Liv on the way. She was on the way to the bathroom, to the toilet, and that, which was consisted of just a portal inside the studio, nothing flash. And he, and all these, he was like, shush, don't talk to her. And I was like, no, nah, man. And I was making her laugh. And I don't know what I was talking about. I was just talking smack, eh? And, um, and I just carried on, I carried on walking with the group. And it, they were trying to sort of shut me out. And she was, she was okay with it. She's like, no, nah, it's all good. And she just carried on talking. And then it got to the point where I was still talking and still keeping the rapport going with her. And she went into the portal, I kid you not, 
and then it kind of when she shut the door I kind of like looked and I was confronted with you know the the minders the makeup people the assistant directors and a bunch of other people probably I don't know her New Zealand agent or something and 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 she goes oh don't stop so I just carried on talking to her for a, for a few moments <laughs> I got myself into the bad books um, straight away but I didn't care because you know I wanted to talk to to Liv Tyler um that 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 was that was that was for me. I was I was excited about that, you know. I, I, you know, I was like, I'm I'm going to keep the story, you know. Um, but not not for me, not too much, not too much conversations with 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 the leads. Obviously, we were working closely with them every day, and there'd be there'd be banter on set, but mostly they were focused and they were they were wanting to work. And and I was happy to just leave them to it. So it was kind of yeah, I didn't I didn't you know. Uh, get into m many sort of deep conversations or friendships, but some people did. Some people, you know, um, there was there was rumors that one of the stunt stunt men, I don't know who it was, mysterious stunt men number twelve or whoever it was, actually slept with Liv while she was in, in Wellington doing the the filming of the Lord of the Rings, and there was a lot of rumors going around. Like there was a girl, and, and that was huge rumor. Right, you're sitting at the lunch tent at sort of four in the morning, and you're like, oh, guess what? And it's like, oh, son, so slept with Liv. Like, you're like what? <laughs> oh man. Like, <laughs> And then the, uh, there was the time where her stalker showed up from from the states, from the USA to to Wellington, and just just rolled up to the um, the Stone Street security thing and said something like, "I'll oh, tell tell Liv Tyler that her stalker's here from 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 the um, from the states." And it just like she went off, she went into her um, like a trailer, and it, they just said, "Oh, she's not doing a scene." It was terrible. Eh? I was like, "Oh man, like no way, that's creepy. That's like creepier than like Stephen King kind of creepy." And it was, <laughs> eh? Some dude just rolls up, eh? Um, we gave, um, I think it was like, because uh, for a while, I didn't go down south and I didn't do the, the they the, the entire, obviously, the all the units moved down south into the south, southern island of New Zealand to do like all the, um, what was it, the, fie the fields of, I don't know, uh, forgives me now, but, you know, all, all the, you know, the massive, um, scenes all the horse scenes i did none of those i got a job i got a i got a day job i i feel terrible admitting this now i got a day job for like six weeks <laughs> and then when they returned to wellington um i jumped back in like a circus but um we were we were sitting around in fidel's cafe one time i got a job for the wardrobe putting on costumes on people when we went up on location i think it was to you know some of the mount doom stuff up to the the um, Mount Ropehu and Tongariro is basically into kind of a dead land, so I can flip some photos through. Um, I was working for wardrobe, so putting costumes on people, and one of the girls from the wardrobe actually, you know, started a relationship with um, with Vigo, and so we, you know, we we're back in Wellington at that point, and we we were sitting around in Fidel's Cafe just on Cuba Street. It's pretty well known, and she walks in late, and so we all give her a standing ovation and start cheering and singing. <laughs> and it was like. <laughs> Some bystanders were there, like, "What? What is it? Her birthday?" And I was like, "Kind of, you know." <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty cool, you know. Like, we would finish, we'd start work at five thirty, and then I think we kind of got to the end of a of a Hell's Hell's Deep shooting, and 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 we'd finish at sort of nine in the morning. And I remember one time it was near the end of Helm's Deep, and we we took over a cafe and shot up with like a couple of vans worth of. Our alcohol and, and the cafe owners were right into it so they shut the cafe for us and it was mostly just stunts and extras and whoever wanted to be there um but it, it was it was pretty cool it was a real it was a real family vibe a real whānau vibe um hey bro very relaxed very casual and just yeah pretty awesome experience um, but yeah in terms of my own uh, interaction with like the leads and the, and the mains it wasn't it wasn't so huge oh there was bits and pieces like I remember going to the pub like when I I think it was like my first week and um, went down the pub and one of my flatmates Bronnie she was doing makeup she was a makeup artist so she was like oh hey Andy this is this is Billy and I was like oh hey man and how's it going as you do and he's like oh what do you do and I was like oh and I was real proud <laughs> I was like oh, um, oh yeah I'm working on this movie because it was you know it was a bit low-key first week I was like, oh, I'm working on this Lord of the Rings movie. And he was like, oh, wow, we're... that's awesome, man. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, bro, I'm a, I'm a pack and save sort of like a B-team, you know, stuntman. I'm doing the background extras and fighting and playing a Yurik and an elf. And 
you know, and I sort of hammed it up a bit. I was like, you know, I did an audition for Hal there, but I, you know, I missed out to Craig Parker, you know, come on. And he goes, oh, wow, that's awesome, bro. Like, and I was like, what about you, man? What do you, what do you do? And he goes, bro, I'm working on the same movie. And I was like, oh, what, you know, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm playing a hobbit. And I was like, get out of town. And it was, um, it was, it was Billy, Billy, Billy boy. And, um, and then, you know, the, the accent clicked in and I was like, oh shit. But he, he wasn't a dick about it. He was, he was real humble when I was like, wow, this guy's the man, you know? Um, but it was just a hilarious way to meet someone, um, you know? So did you ever have any negative interactions with anybody on the, on the cast? From the cast, from the, from the um, no, no, I can't, re- I can't remember any, any negative interactions from, from the leads or anything like that. I mean, there may have been, but um, yeah, I don't remember that happening. Um, I do remember trying to steal Gandalf's um, Benson and Hedges cigarettes. I think it was on a, in, in a studio one day on set. And it's like he had, um, it wasn't a negative experience, but it was just kind of like a little bit silly. I was falling around and I, I think I'd had too much coffee and I was smoking cigarettes at the time. And I just went, I went to grab them and he turned around like a ninja. And he just grabbed them like he even knew I was there, but I was being super silent. And um, <laughs> he just like gave me that, that Gandalf, you know, in McAllen look and just laughed at me like, yeah, you little elf chump. Or I, thought, I think it might've been a Citadel guard that day or something. But I, I thought I was hilarious. I thought I was, I thought I was a real funny guy for doing that. Um, and then later that day, cause I wasn't, you know, I was kind of on standby, you know, I was like, Oh, you know, stand here, wait here, you know, we'll, we'll call you if we need you. That was the, that was the, the, that was the sort of the highlight of, of, of my life in some ways, or, or, or the, you know, or was it hurry up and wait? A lot of extras would say that. Say, like, how's your day? Oh, hurry up and wait. Um, and then we were just, I, was, I think I was just talking to a sound man and I was like, you know, I was kind of, oh, how does that work? And what does this do? And, you know, the guys that have their headphones on and the, the thing around their waist and, you know, they've got a, either a boom mic or they don't or whatever. And then later on, he goes, check this out, because Ian had gone in and done some stuff. And, you know, as Gandalf and, you know, done some lines and had a mic pack on him and, you know, and, and bug it off. And then he goes, check this out. And I was like, what's that? And he, he didn't let me hear it, but he just goes, um, it's Gandalf. He's in his trailer with his, with his, with his boyfriend. And, um, you know, I think there's some stuff happening. And I was like, what, really? No way. And he's like, yes, bro. <laughs> And I was like, get out of town. And, I, and he goes, oh, I better do the right thing. I better go and tell one of the assistant directors. So, um, so you know, says so she can grab it off him because this is, you know, this is coming from my headphones and it was actually on record. And I was like, oh. So I sort of just sidled along with the sound man and the assistant director. And she knocks on the door. She's like, Ian, <laughs> comes to the door. He's sort of like, yes, <laughs> sort of get our voice. And she goes, oh, we just need a mic up another actor. Can we just grab that mic pack off you? You know, I don't know if she said, bro, she probably didn't. And he said something like, could you hear me? Could you hear? And she goes, no, 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 no. We just need to mic up another actor. We were just missing a battery pack. Can we just grab that off you? And I mean, he knew and she knew, but she was being polite. And I was just like cracking up. He couldn't, you know, was sort of just out of sight. And, and then she goes, sheesh, fuel. Thanks for that. And then she grabbed <laughs> and took off. But yeah, that was pretty funny. Um, I was like, oh yeah. And then someone, one of my mates, one of his, um, it was pretty funny, like one of his mates from high school actually hooked up with Gandalf while he was uh, in, in Wellington. And um, he made it to TV. Like this guy, he went, he took him to like some Oscar party or some, you know, celebration in New York City. And my mate Nick was like, hey, there's that dude that I used to go to school with. He's, he's with Ian McKellen, crack up. But uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. Um, lots, lots, of, lots of silliness. But there yeah, was a time. Good. Yeah, so, silly's good, and 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 it was. It made made working those those longer days um, a lot easier. You know, twelve hour minimum, sometimes sixteen, sometimes a little bit longer. A bit of travel time in there. But I remember I was going to. Yeah, I was going to ask that Andy how long the days typically were, and I mean, you had to stay exhausted during that period. I, I this it gets me tired thinking of it now. The role had to be exhausting as well. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, I mean, sometimes that's us say, you know, a plan for 12 hours, but then some travel time and then maybe some overtime afterwards. But everyone didn't care because it was such an awesome production to be on. 
Yeah. Um, but I remember sometimes I'd change the schedule. They'd say, oh, your call time for tomorrow is 5.30. You're like, cool. You go straight to wardrobe. And then once you've got wardrobe, you go to makeup. You go to, after makeup, you can go to breakfast. So sometimes you get to breakfast at like seven and you'd be hungry. You'd be like, I'm hungry. But you would have had the opportunity to grab a coffee or, or a hot chocolate and, you know, whatever. And then it had hit to 12 hours. And then they'd say, oh, it's time and a half. And then if it got to 13, it would be, you know, whatever it was, T2. But then I think we did like a 16-hour day or even longer. Then they showed up with like a, like a whole van load of like McDonald's burgers and um, KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. So that was kind of a bonus. So they were great employers like that. <laughs> Just the little things. Yeah, the chicken's good. The gravy and mashed potatoes are good. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, in the first <laughs> week, it was like for me, you know, it was like sort of, it was like Thanksgiving, like Christmas dinner every day. Um, and, and so overeating in the first week. And then in the second week, it was like, oh, okay, you know, take it easy. So it, chill out. As the, as the trilogy began to wind down, what did you find yourself getting into afterwards? Yeah, good call. Good call. It was kind of afterwards, it was sort of like, oh, man, like it was a little bit of a come down. It was like, oh, what am I doing now? Um, for me, it was kind of like the whole time I was doing DJing at that time and putting on gigs here and there. And I had a like a residency so I could sort of carry on with the music stuff, sort of DJing and doing vocals and, you know, hosting drum and bass DJs and you know just getting really excited about that and I did another um another play um with some people and it was all about the first undercover female cop a uh, policewoman in New Zealand with another lady uh, Liz Kirkman and um Holly and a guy Shannon and we put that on as a one-hour piece and it was really cool because it was the story of Liz's auntie and it was a true story about sort of this woman and so I got to play um, a drug dealer for that so that, that was pretty exciting um, as a sort of like a little follow-up um, coming cool. out of working on Lord of the Rings. And then, yeah, and then yeah. I got into the, the dark world of sales and selling uh, finance, <laughs> um, the dark arts. And Absolutely. So I got, right, got right into sales after that, which was kind of like, yeah, it was strange. Eh? I mean, but I did need to have, a, I did need, I felt the need to have a, a bit of a break from um, being on set. Um, some people love being on set. Some people Obviously, they want to be on set if it's their film, if they're directing, if they're the writer, if they're. Um, but yeah, it, it's pretty cool. But it does, yeah, it takes it takes a bit of a toll um, being on set like six days a week. But for for that movie, I mean, yeah, that was worth it. That, that was amazing. Did and, you find uh, that your life had changed for the better after the series? Like the people, because it had to be a cool thing though. After the series kind of picked up, like I would think. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it was just, I mean, it was kind of like being an extra, being being able to feature, like I fired an arrow in the two towers and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, that, that was all I wanted. I mean, that was all I wanted was to just get a little, a little feature and to say, hey, I, I, you know, I did, I did a little feature in this, this massive, you know, trilogy, this Lord of the Rings, and I got featured firing an arrow on the, on the, on the wall in the, in the helm seat breach. And that was all I w really wanted. But then after that, it was it was exciting to just have that, you know, um, yeah. those memories and to have those networks. I mean, I was living in a warehouse. We had 20 rooms, probably more like 20 or 30 people living there. Um, pretty well known right in the middle of Wellington. And we had at one point, I think we had about 10 people working on Lord of the Rings right in 2000 in the main filming. So during the week, people would be pretty much at work. And then Saturday night, there'd be, you know, a few beers and a few, you know, a few beats, um, you know, turn the party up. And then it was sort of, you know, that one day off and then just backs back into it. So, I mean, it was, it was pretty cool. A lot of those, some of those people are still working in the industry now. Um, I can probably give you some deets. Hope they don't mind. Um, you might even be able to interview them for your, for your pods, podcast or something. Yeah, that'd be so, awesome. Yeah, I guess yeah, I mean, there's some great people out there. I mean, people it, from all walks, you know, whether they're working in special effects or with a digital or, yeah, I mean, um, awesome people. And I guess for me, that was what it was all about, you know, having some fun, you know, learning some new skills, um, yeah. you know, learning to be close to camera. Um, and at, at the time, I was like, wow, this, this, is, this is just... The business it was, it was very exciting and then going along to all the 
there's a premiere and sort of parading around like the, I think it was the return of the King premiere, the, the world premiere that they had in Wellington. That was exciting, you know, racing around as a, as a Gondorian ranger and basically spending a day as your character. That, that was some good times. So, yeah, so I guess it's, it's, it's definitely been worth it. It's definitely still has sort of a, a kind of resonance now, you know, 20 years later to celebrate that, that anniversary. Yeah. Well, I'll let you know in the States, my friend, that the uh, trilogy is still very hot and popular. I've seen it in theaters. That's one good thing about this COVID. When they weren't making movies, they actually played it in theaters here back during the summer. So it's still a hot topic here. So That's fantastic to hear that they're still, they're still playing them in the theaters where, where they should be seen on the, you know, on the grand scale with that, that digital sound and that, you know, that enormous screen. Do you do you follow all the uh, like the director's cuts and the extended versions and the various other? Oh well, yeah, I watch the uh, extended cuts. It's only the only true cut for me. Nice, nice. Yeah, you're a purist. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Watched all the movies probably a thousand times. Reading the books pretty much constantly. So, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. But Andy, Man, I mean, we uh, we close. Is there anything we've not talked about you want to talk about or any kind of pitch you want to make? Um, just just going through there's a couple of notes I wrote down oh, I may as well end on this the um, when I when I when, basically when the two towers went into the cinemas and we hadn't seen it we, we were like you know we didn't know what was up you know we, we hoped we got a little um, a feature in there and I knew I'd done a feature because the casting agent said this is your feature shot you know, the one that made it to the, the card, the um, Balgolin, the game card. And I remember um, there was a guy who's um, pretty well-known, um, Sala Baker. He played um, Sauron and uh, some of the um, hero um, Urukais, the Berserkers, potentially. And uh, he's, he's still in Hollywood now. You can find him really easily. And, and he came out and he had seen it. And he said, he, he just said, your face is like right up on the screen for your, for your feature, bro. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you did that big pukana. And, and he... And he that's which is like from Maori culture, which is like your 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 war face on. And he goes, you did that for the elves. And then some people say the elves are supposed to be like serene. And but I want I remember wanting to do that to put a little tiny little bit of <laughs> <laughs> of Kiwiana on, on that elven character. But they bought it they, they, and they put it in there. And it's so quick. It's like a, you know it's like a one or two second thing. But but he said it was different in the in the cinematic cut than it was to the the DVD cut. So yeah, I'd have to go to a cinema to see it again. But other than that, man, I just want to um, just to thank you guys for, for reaching out to me and, I mean, having me on your podcast. Um, I, I didn't expect this. I just thought, I'll, you know, because I was inspired by another guy who put up a couple of pictures on the, on the tutorial page, uh, James. And I thought, oh, I've got a couple of photos. I can throw those up. So I didn't expect to be on a podcast. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart uh, for having me here. Um, I'm so grateful. And if you, if you need anything else, um, just let me know. Um, but yeah, you're so, you're so, you're so, um, you know, welcome and yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes, guys, thank you. this has been the Wolfpack perspective. We'll keep Andy around for just a few minutes and talk to him after we end this, but Andy, we appreciate you coming on, buddy. Absolutely. Yeah. You're welcome. It's so great to be here. Thanks um, for your hard work, guys. Thank you.